So, hands up if you've met a futurist before. Yeah, who have you met? Oh, Paul. Do you know that there are actually 25,000 of us in our professional society, the World Future Society? 25,000 futurists. About a third work in academia and research. About a third work in uh, government and NGOs. And about a third work in the commercial world. That's where I come from. And I get to work with all sorts of really interesting uh, major corporations, networks of businesses, peak industry groups like yours, and they call me up to give me a briefing, and almost every briefing eventually gets to this discussion of how fast the world is changing. And they'll say, our theme for the conference is transformation or innovation or the future. And they'll say something to me during this call, almost every time that goes something like this. Craig, I've been involved in this industry for over 30 years and we've seen more change in the last three than I've seen in 30. And I said to the president of the Cotton Growers Association, give me an example of that, please. And he went on to say how because of GM, they had, uh, they had this fu uh, futurist come along from the CSIRO um, you know, about five years ago and uh, made this uh, outlandish prediction that 50% of all of cotton grown in Australia would be GM uh, within five years. And do you know what happened? It went to 100% within three. And he said, the problem is with you guys. I said, who? American geeks? He said, no, you futurists, you don't want to scare us too much, so you're always ultra conservative with your predictions. So it, actually, if you hear something today that you think that's not possible, then I've done my job. But it is possible, and you will see it. Maybe you'd like to join us, continue the conversation. There are um, dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, people in, uh, that are futurists working in your industry that are part of the World Future Society, WFS. And when you go to futurist school, did you know you can get a degree in Australia at futurist school? One of our longest running programs, Swinburne University in Melbourne. Anybody here from Melbourne? We've graduated 900 students. They all have gainful employment, 100% employment, not bad. So uh, I chose business people and technology and how they all intersect. And today we're going to be talking about the driving forces that are changing the world and then drilling down to your particular industry. But this is going to require that you have a conversation with someone. I'm going to play some, um, show some slides and play some videos and it's, I'm going to give you an opportunity to discuss with a partner. So if you're sitting alone, you need to, f to find a le learning partner. Maybe you move back one chair. So everybody, do you have someone you can, you can uh, chat with? Make sure that you're sitting uh, somewhere you can chat with someone because I'm going to ask you to discuss some of the content that I'm going to share with you. This is called, I went back to school to study um, accelerated learning specifically for adults. And what we found, how adults learn is a little bit different from kids. That d adults have to have time to reflect on what they've learned so they can embed it into their long-term memory. Even if it's just 30 seconds, your retention level goes up 88%. Who would like to try this? Would you like to try this? Would you like to accelerate your learning and amplify your learning by 88%? Or should I skip over this part? <laughs> no? Okay, let's have a go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to play a video called Did You Know? And it was produced by one of my uh, colleagues from the World Future Society. And it looks at the major sociological, technological, and business models that are going to emerge by 2028. And the reason that they chose this date when they produced it at the end of last year is because if you have kids and they're entering school uh, at the, uh, last year, then this is the year that they'd be graduating. So, are you ready? You've got your task. I'm going to play the video. It's just 
two minutes and 18 seconds long. And then at the end of it, you're gonna turn to your learning partner. You're gonna turn to your learning partner and you're gonna ask them, what was the most interesting thing that you saw in the video? And then you're gonna swap. You're just gonna have a little discussion. I'm gonna give you about 45 seconds to do that. You got the task? Here we go with a little bit of accelerated learning, looking at global worldwide trends with Did You Know That in 2028? Opportunity, that's the dichotomy of the future, peril and opportunity at the same time. You are either being disrupted or you're the disruptor. Which will you be? Time to discuss with your learning partner. You have 45 seconds. Your time begins now. What was the most interesting thing that you saw? Wow, what a thoughtful crowd. <laughs> What was it? Just somebody share. Who would like to put their hand up? What was the most surprising thing to them? Yes, here. At 63, I'm pleased. In 28 years, I could go past 100. <laughs> yes, and many of us will. We're extending uh, the average human life uh, a year every two years. My friends that are medical futurists who know a lot more about this than I do say within five years, we'll extend human life a year every year, and what will the world look like because of that? Somebody else over here, yes. Yeah, who would have thought that Spanish would be the second uh, largest spoken language, and it's not because of the population, but it's how the language lasts through generation. I have many Spanish-speaking friends in Sydney. We go out for salsa dancing and burritos with pulled pork in them, yum. Yum. And I'll say to my Spanish speaking friends, what generation are you? And they'll have to figure it out in their head. And many of them are fourth and fifth generation still speaking Spanish at home, as opposed to uh, my friends from, that uh, are just the first generation in Australia and they've lost their mother tongue in one generation. Spanish goes four or five generations. If you'd like to know more about this, there's a group of futurists in the United Nations that follow uh, the, the spread of language. You just go to UN Research and you'll find it. An Australian used to be in charge of this, a great futurist by the name 
of, of, of oh, well, now it just went like that. <laughs> Keith, Keith. So did you see that it was predicted that we would be able to uh, store all of the internet on strands of DNA? Well, this is just from a, a few weeks ago, just about a month ago. Microsoft is buying its first 10 million molecules of custom DNA from a San Francisco startup to store everything on the internet. Genetic modification when it comes to data scientists and your industry will be a recurring theme throughout food globally and in the IT space. And if you'd like to know more about this, I don't have a, a lot of time in my speech, but if you'd like to follow up and learn more about this, a great uh, colleague and teacher of mine by the name of uh, Peter Diamandis wrote a fantastic book in 2012 called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think, along with his partner Stephen Kotler, and it talks about the eight exponential technologies that will change every industry in the world and the biggest, 10 biggest problems that we have in the world, including education, uh, energy, uh, equity, e equal rights, and talks about how these exponential technologies will solve the world's biggest problems. It's a great, optimistic view of the future. You can get it as a book or an audio book, or you can go on to TED.com and see the 20-minute video version of it. Just type in abundance of futures better than you think, and you will find it. This is your homework to do if you um, want to become an optimist about the future. The exponential technologies that will change every industry, including yours, and I know I'm gonna read these off to you and you're gonna go, how could those possibly change our industry? Are, number one, infinite computing, two, sensors and networks, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, digital medicine, nanomaterials, and artificial intelligence. And we will come back to these shortly, but I want to show you how quickly they are changing every industry first and then what it means to you as an industry group. I work with startups all around the world. Many of them are now valued at more than a billion dollars. More than a billion dollars. Some of them are valued at more than 10 billion, more than 20 billion. <laughs> Some are valued now at more than 60 billion dollars and they haven't even listed on the stock market yet. There's actually a billion dollar startup cl club and there it is, 145 businesses that have looked at those exponential technologies and connected themselves to those exponential technologies so they could go through this phenomenal growth. One of my clients from this group recently went out to raise an extra billion dollars cash. And I asked them, how, how are you possibly going to raise an extra billion dollars? And they said, we are giving our potential investors one metric, one, one set, set of data, and then we asked them, do you want to invest or not? I said, well, what's that data that you're giving them? They said uh, that we're doubling our revenue every three and a half months. Doubling our revenue every three and a half months. Do you think they had any problem raising a billion dollars? These exponential organizations are coming into every industry, including yours, and spending one-tenth of the capital investment and producing 10 times the entire industry group. They're spending one-tenth of the typical investment and producing 10 times the entire industry group. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. At the top of the list is, is a small company, you may have heard of them, it's called Uber. It's valued at $62 billion. It's raised billions of dollars. The entire taxi industry, I know this because I work with the taxi industry in America, the entire taxi industry is only valued at uh, $12 billion US. They're already valued at $62 billion and they're one organization. How long until they're valued at $100 billion? and 10 times the entire industry. How long, you think? Not long. Not long. And the list goes on. DD's there. Apple just invested a billion dollars in the, for the uh, biggest, uh, biggest ride-sharing company in China because 
Uber wouldn't take their money. <laughs> the list goes on. There's DJI, a drone manufacturer that couldn't exist four years ago because we hadn't sold billions of smartphones that drove down the remote sensors, tilt, shift, accelerometers, GPS, infrared cameras, and so on. Because we sold billions of smartphones, now they can manufacture jump drones, and now you can get a drone that I fly around in my house, fits in the palm of your hand, it's $25. It's a toy, but some Primary producers, for instance, are now flying over their broad field farming in installations with high-resolution HD uh, infrared uh, cameras and figuring out where to apply the fertilizer, where to water the plants. Just to give you an idea of how these organizations that have linked themselves to these exponential technologies, and this is why I want you to see um, you could link your industry, your organization, to these exponential technologies as well. I mean, uh, just look at Uber as an organization. Not are they bigger than the entire taxi industry. They're the world's largest transport, transportation company and far bigger than both GM and Ford. And they did that in less than five years. So let me ask you this question. Where were you five years ago? Are you bigger than the um, biggest in the industry? And look how fast they did that. Number two, Airbnb. Heard of them? <laughs> if you work in the tourism industry or local council, you know all about them. They are the world's what? Biggest accommodation provider. Owns no real estate. No capital investment. None. This drives my major clients like the International Hotel Group who invested $19 billion in new hotels last quarter. They said, Rispin, um, how do we compete with Airbnb? We spent, we've invested $19 billion in, uh, in new hotels and they've spent nothing. I said, well, that's the definition of an exponential organization. I said, how about next quarter you don't invest another 19 billion? How about you invest 18 billion and put a billion into Airbnb and sit on their board so you know everything that they're doing? They said, wow, what an innovative idea. <laughs> Just saying, engage with this community. Where are the startups in your community? If, you, if they're not here, they're gonna be here and suddenly they're gonna be bigger than everybody in this room if you're not watching. Just saying. The list goes on. Airbnb, more valuable than Marriott and Hilton, and soon they will be more valuable than Marriott and Hilton combined. Just saying. And th four weeks ago, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, uh, a listed startup, because they really are a startup, they've only been around for a few years, completely changed the auto industry when Tesla, I call this a short a watershed moment. We just had a watershed moment. The last watershed moment we had was when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone in 2007. Customers queued up for the iPhone. People queued up for a car. They didn't know how much it was going to be. They hoped that it was going to be half the price of the Tesla S, which was about $100,000 US. It turned out to be $35,000 US. And all you had to do was put down $1,000 and then be patient while they make enough cars to deliver to you uh, in some time in 2017. Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX and inventor of the Hyperloop, uh, said we were really surprised that 400,000 consumers uh, ordered uh, these cars. I'm going to, could you just turn this one, this um, lapel down and I'll use because we're getting feedback there we go that's better Elon said that he was really surprised that they got 400,000 orders the reason he was really surprised is that if they can ship that many cars in 12 months um, Tesla will be the best-selling car in the world 
Here's the list to prove it. This, this is just U.S. sales down from uh, number 10 down to number one at the bottom. The two best-selling cars in America last year were the Camry and the Corolla. The Camry only sold 361,000. We know they have at least 400,000 orders for the Tesla. I think you're going to hear an announcement that they've got 500,000, more than 500,000 pre-orders. And this will make it the best-selling car in America, overnight, essentially. The world, I can't walk away from that. <laughs> I'm, was it annoying to you? Did you hear that feedback? Okay, I'll stick to the lectern. I usually don't. Um, the world is shifting, isn't it? And you, as a business or organization, have to shift as well don't you? Because there will be an Uber of your industry, and they're probably out there right now, but they didn't attend this year. Because Uber doesn't attend the taxi industry conference either. So here's the question to ask your learning partner. When will we see the Uber of our industry? You have 60 seconds to discuss. Your time begins now. I think there might be. Here's the good news. Would you like to hear the good news? Consumer interest in pigs and pork is at a high point ever in human history. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought that in a single month, two major books come out on Amazon that are all about your industry, talking about maybe um, getting back to simpler processes, one guy that went cold turkey on all antibiotics, really interesting talk about transparency and how it's affecting your industry. So if you'd like a little uh, light reading about your uh, industry, and you don't have to read it, by the way, you can download it as an audio book and you know, pop your earphones on while you're busy uh, Working, that's what I do. I listen to audiobooks and do housework. If I evacuate, no, it's true. <laughs> My wife is, why this sudden interest in housework? <laughs> Honey, can I uh, vacuum? And I put my Bluetooth headphones on, and I go, this is really interesting. I'm getting exercise at the same time. Maybe listen to it as, at the gym. So pigtails and omnivores quest for sustainable meat, really interesting conversation that you could have with your colleagues in the industry. Came out. Um, and then a day later, uh, Lesser Beasts, a snout-to-tail history of the humble pig. And the main premise of this uh, book is how important that pork is as a primary protein all around the world. Uh, but it's an animal that only produces one thing, meat, as opposed to the other animals that produce multiple things like um, wool and meat, for instance. Well, that is all about to change because pigs in the future will produce more than one thing. Did you know this? <laughs> more than food. And it's just around the corner. It is just around the corner. More proof. Two million people <laughs> per episode, American hoggers. More proof, you can go to Google Trends, that's google.com slash trends, type in pulled pork. Do you think people love pulled pork like I do? <laughs> do you, would you like to know which countries they prefer per pulled pork in? Would you like to know when they're typing into Google pulled pork? Would you like to know that? Well, you can set up a campaign specifically around that and you could have a video, anyway, it's there. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. There's more interest in your product than ever before in human history. Here's the proof. Here's some more proof. You've heard of the, the pig adventure? You've heard of the pig adventure? Pig adventure is a, a small uh, um, facility where uh, c consumers are going along, they're driving off the freeway, they see something that's listed on TripAdvisor that's got 224 reviews at four, four and a half or five stars. If something has four and a, over 200 reviews on TripAdvisor, and if it was on the Gold Coast, I would go there. 
there are no attractions on the Gold Coast that have reviews this high to give you an idea. And you know what it is? It's a de demonstrator pig farm in a controlled environment revealing um, w what modern facility looks like. And why did they do this? By the way, they're getting more than 200,000 visitors per year now. 200,000. They're on their way, they say, in a few years' time, to get about 2 million a year. 2 million visitors a year to a pig farm. <laughs> why? People are interested in going to the supermarket now and scanning a barcode and knowing where that product comes from. They're more inclined to drink coffee that's single source coffee than multiple uh, so source coffee rather than a blend because they want to know the whole supply chain. It's all about transparency. And it's happening in every industry and including yours. And if you want to combat the radicals, do you know who I'm talking about? Radical fundamentalists that are trying to destroy your industry? How do you fix that? Education. Education. Be transparent. Be transparent. In the U.S., awareness is growing around that successful welfareist campaigns are relating to people being poorly informed about pig farming. Therefore, in Indiana's Fair Oaks Farm, it developed a pig adventure. It's uh, agro-tourism, literally on top of a new breeding uh, facility. If you don't know about this, just Google it. There's tons of YouTube videos. Um, it was so successful at their, um, you know, their cattle farm, their car cow farm, then they did pigs next. Very, very popular. Consumers want to know, I know because I work with an association that licenses every barcode in the world, and they want to be able to scan a barcode and know, is that fish actually from the Pacific Island, Pacific Islands, or did it come in from Taiwan, or Thailand, or Russia? They want to know where their products are coming from. So, let's talk about those exponential technologies and this is where I get into some things where people say, Rispin, that couldn't possibly be true. And I have to tell you, everything I've got, I've got stacks of data, 4,000 data points <laughs> to prove what I say. Let's talk about tech innovations that could impact pork production and, and specifically impact it in a good way or in a negative way. It's all up to you to decide whether you're going to be the disruptor or be disrupted, and it's all about having a mindset. Will I connect myself to these exponential technologies, or will I be wiped out because of them? It's all about mindset. Just reminding you, do you want to take a snapshot of that just before I go on? What the eight exponential technology, I've uploaded my slides to LinkedIn so you all can get them from LinkedIn, <laughs> but do you just want to take, grab your phone and take a picture of that so you don't forget it? Infinite computing, sensors and networks, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, digital medicine, mat nanomaterials, and artificial intelligence. Have you got that? Do you look at that list and you go, how could that possibly impact us? I'll start with you, I'll start gently. <laughs> uh, because I know you've heard it all before. You've heard that a super fast internet is coming to you wherever you live in Australia. <laughs> you may have even heard that um, our current uh, prime minister wanted to cancel the launch of the satellites, but he couldn't. So a $2 billion investment, I know a little bit about satellite technology, I've worked in this industry for quite a few years. I know the satellites that are going up and I know that uh, canceling the project now would cost them $2 billion. So it's going to happen, and it's just happening now. You're going to look at some of these technologies and go, we can't participate in that world, Craig, because we don't have an internet connection. That is all about to change. And by the way, these satellites run on batteries, and in 16 years, they'll fall out of the sky. So you, and unless they stick up more satellites, in 16 years, it's going to be gone. 
So make good use of them while you can. I know you've heard it before, but this is reality. I know about satellites and I'm thinking about moving to the country because I can't get a fast enough connection compared to this. I've tested it myself. I would love to have a five gigabit uh, upload so I can upload my YouTube videos faster. I'm thinking about moving to the country. I'm telling you. And I'm going to get four satellite dishes. <laughs> and I'm going to tie them all together. And I don't care if it costs me $100 a month per, per dish. It's worth every single penny. And then I'm going to put an antenna up on my property. And I can go, I don't know, 150 kilometers now with an antenna on my property. So I've got Wi-Fi across my entire property. It only costs a few hundred dollars these days. It's coming and it's gonna be everywhere. And if you had the old satellite dishes, which was hacked together with a bit of bailing wire and <laughs> duct tape, it's not gonna be anything like that. They already have it in Thailand and it rocks. It's fantastic. How come Thailand got it first? Just saying. Did you see this? For those in remote areas, change is in the air. If you live away from major centres or in small local towns, then internet help is not far away, thanks to the $2 billion MBN Skymuster. It promises speed and a whole new world for regional users. It's the largest investment in rural and regional telecommunications infrastructure in our lifetime. It's a game changer. Uh, it's, it'll affect how people work, how they live, and how they learn. This game changer rocketed into orbit in 2015. Another satellite will be launched in a few months to provide additional capacity. Capacity that is expected to service 400,000 homes in remote areas. People have had a really tough time accessing data or using the internet properly without interruption. Simon and Carleen Barton only live 25 k's from town, but for years they've struggled with poor service. We have lots of issues with pages dropping out and uh, having to reload and, and you just never know whether something's been sent um, or whether you've got to do it again. Carleen often found herself driving into town just to upload a video for work. We have a website, um, we like to sell stock online um, and so we find it very difficult to, to be um, competitive. It's going to be wow and you know we're not going to be looking at um, movies or anything like that we're just going to be excited to be able to get in and do what we do. Those in our regional cities may in fact be jealous. Skymuster offers speeds four times faster than ADSL which means catching up on that favourite TV show or making a vital Skype call will be easy. The country people for the first time will have a better service than many 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 city people. If you're not in an area that is due to be serviced by MBN's fixed line, then you'll be eligible, which is the case for thousands just on the outskirts of our cities and towns. There's never been a more exciting time to be a regional or rural internet user. Customer installations get underway this April and plans start as low as $34. You'll just be excited to load a page by the sound. Absolutely. <laughs> Evie Madden, Prime 7 News. The biggest investment in rural and regional uh, telecommunications in the history of your lifetimes, and you'll never see it again. You've only got 16 years. What are you gonna do with it? You've only got 16 years. Discuss with a partner, you have 90 seconds. What are you gonna be doing with all this added bandwidth? You have 90 seconds to discuss. What are you gonna be doing with the bandwidth? I'll tell you what I'll be doing with it. Infinite computing and artificial intelligence. The cost of doing computing now is rapidly approaching the cost of zero. To store unlimited photos, for instance, on Google Photos, the cost is, do you use Google Photos? Unlimited photos, how much does that cost? It's free, yeah, and the photos, and video, by the way, they take video as well. I've uploaded many, many gigabytes of photos. I uploaded 15 years of digital photos and video over a couple days. It took a while to upload, and it didn't cost me anything. This is approaching infinite for free. This is an example of infinite computing. And artificial intelligence, or as um, 
Google now wants to call it machine learning. Another name for it is machine learning because machine learning doesn't sound as creepy as artificial intelligence, <laughs> but it's the same thing. And so at Google Photos, you upload pictures. And um, when our kids were little, we used to go to the zoo and a, 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 a local little zoo near our house. And there were uh, wombats that you could uh, you know, pet. And I couldn't believe it. Google Photos recognized all the photos of wombats as wombats. And you can type in wombat, and instantly all your photos of wombats pop up. Um, I thought Google would just think it was a fat cat. <laughs> this is an example of infinite computing with machine learning, artificial intelligence, recognizing uh, photos. Uh, it's incredible what it can do. Here's another example. Google has a new email tool called Inbox. As an email comes in, I've given it permission to read my email. It looks through the email message and very eerily figures out how I would typically reply. So it suggests the things that I might say. So for instance, uh, in last November, I had somebody send me, we'd like to invite you all to join for an early Thanksgiving on November 22nd, beginning around 2 p.m. Please bring your favorite dish and RSVP by next week. And at the bottom, it's suggesting that I would say, count us in, and that's the kind of thing I would say, uh, we'll be there, or sorry, we can't, uh, won't be able to make it. And it's actually looked at my calendar to see if I have anything planned on that day, and will respond, um, it's, it's awesome. And this morning I was processing my email. I don't know if you guys uh, do email at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I ask this question, sometimes I ask, uh, how much email do you guys do? Uh, let's just do a little test in the crowd. Do you do a more than an hour of email per day? More than an hour, more than two hours, more than three, more than four, more than five, more than five, more than six? Sometimes there's more than six. More than six, wow, you win. <laughs> and you get paid for all that email time, right? Hopefully you do. Uh, uh, many of my clients that have moved over to Google Inbox um, are processing their email you know, in half the time. It is, um, but you have to be able to uh, put up with what people are saying is privacy. It's not privacy when you have an algorithm read your email. It's, privacy is about somebody else reading your email. But if it's an algorithm and Google can't see it because it's encrypted, then it's not really reading your email, it's just an algorithm. It's not somebody else reading your email. Although the NSA can do that anywhere in the world. You know. <laughs> Just saying, yeah. <laughs> Some people don't want to get this thing uh, at, uh, Google just announced called a Google Home, and it's a little device that's coming out in a few months' time. You can put it in your home, and anywhere in the house, you can just say, okay, Google, uh, check my flight back to uh, Sydney, and it will respond. And people are like, oh, but, but you know, that's really creepy because it's, the microphone has to stay on full time you know, people could uh, be listening to you like law enforcement. And uh, I have to tell them, I go to law enforcement conferences and um, they can already do that. <laughs> you think I'm making this up. I mean, just think about it. This Google Home is just another Android device and you probably have an Android device or you have an Apple iPhone and it already has a camera and a microphone in it. If they wanted to listen to your conversation, do you think they couldn't? Just saying. <laughs> yeah, all the telcos in Australia actually sell this as a service to the police and they make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just saying. So there's a big shift away because Google championed the cloud and they said for very little money, you can have something that's appropriate, you know, uh, better than Microsoft Office. And people say, Rispin, do you really think a lot of people are using uh, Google Apps, and I say to them, every school kid in the country, every university, a Qantas, Woolies, hopefully your organization, have moved over to Google Apps. 
because it's designed to operate in the cloud, even for really bad connections in Botswana. Did you hear Google went down for eight seconds in Botswana? Did you hear that? Did you hear that, that Telstra went down for five days here in Australia? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor, ask them, are you willing to give up a little privacy, which you don't really have anyway? Are you willing to give up a little privacy to use some of these incredibly cheap, productive tools to help you in your job? Are you willing to do that? You have 45 seconds to discuss. Your time begins now. Let's see a show in the room. Hands up if you're willing to give up the privacy that you don't really have to get access to these tools. You're willing to give up privacy. Yeah, hands up if that really creeps you out and you're never gonna do that. No, no. I haven't found anyone that, would, you know, that won't be on Facebook or sign up for Google. Uh, people are willing to exchange privacy for a, a service that makes their life better or connects them to their grandkids or what have you. I have yet to see, there's only very few people that say I won't do that. So, imagine if we had every business, every pig farm, every supplier, every uh, outlet, all connected on the same uh, network across the country. How long until that happens? About 24 months. Got your order in? Got your order in? If you don't have your order in, you're not in the queue. Have you got your order in for SkyMuster? Yeah? Put your hand up if you got your order in for SkyMuster. Really? Do you know there's a waiting list? And you could be waiting upwards of two years if you're not on the waiting list. Put your hand up if you're going on the waiting list right after this session. <laughs> Get on the list! I'm on the list and I don't even live in the country. I use my buddy's address. Because <laughs> they don't know where the satellite dish is, so I'm just gonna move it to my house in Sydney. Oh, did I say that? Can you, can you edit that out of the video? Imagine then we have a network and if we trusted our colleagues to say to us, um, I'd be willing to share what I'm doing on, in my piggery with you so we could have a benchmark for the entire industry as long as you uh, anonymized my data so we could all grow together. Not that you could look at my farm and see what I'm doing to compete with you, but generally we could see how the industry is going right now in a real-time snapshot and some people that are producing great results could share it with the rest of the, the team. Isn't that what this association is really about? Is it about learning together? Imagine if we connected sensors and networks, sensors to these networks, and we said, in our association, what we decided to do is to be open and transparent, but anonymized, and I'd like to participate, I'm opting in to connect real-time sensors on my farm to my financials and share it with the industry group so we can help one another. Who would do that? Who would not do that? Who doesn't want to put their hand up? <laughs> Very many industry groups that, I've, um, that I deal with now do this. You know who's done this in this country? All the lawyers. All the lawyers got together and they've made their financials transparent to their colleagues um, to help uh, their industry. I'm not making this up, am I? Yeah, just saying. And we're about to have low-cost sensors that you could attach to the ear of, I know you're already doing this, but wait until it does everything. Attach to the ear of that pig, and what is it gonna pick up? It's gonna smell disease, CSIRO has already got a patent on this. It's gonna smell disease. It's gonna know the CO2 output. It's gonna know the oxygen intake. It's gonna know the efficiency of converting that feed to that out through the CO2 gases coming through their skin, you're gonna be able to monitor every single animal in real time. Because every government in the world is talking about food security right now, aren't they? <laughs> 
and they want to be able to track all the way back to your farm if there's a problem. You're gonna have to do this anyway. Can you jump on top of it to begin with? Let's talk about sensors and networks. It used to be really, really, really expensive to be able to scan something and get data. In fact, it used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for something called near-field IR scanning, where you could take a bit of a single grain of wheat, scan it with a mass spectrometer, and it could tell you everything about that single grain. This used to be really expensive. It now cost $100. Imagine if you have one of these sensors on your farm. Have a look at this invented by some smart people in Israel. The technology at our fingertips can help us do amazing things. It can help us navigate the world, know which restaurant to book tonight, or know what song is playing on the radio. But when it comes to the actual stuff around us, if we're not sure or just don't know, well, you're on your own. I'm Damien. And I'm Dwar. I'm excited to introduce Sayo. Sayo is the first molecular sensor that fits in the palm of your hand. It scans the molecular fingerprint of an object and provides relevant instant information about its chemical makeup. You can use it to log the chemical fingerprint, record it, and share with your friends. Imagine if there was a way to know which watermelon is sweeter. When is that avocado going to ripen? How many calories, carbs, or proteins are in that shape? How your plants are doing? Imagine if there was a way to know the chemical makeup of everything you come in contact with. The applications are endless. Saya uses this tiny optical sensor called a spectrometer, which absorbs light reflected back from an object and breaks it down into a spectrum. The spectrum is then sent to our cloud for analysis, and our algorithms sends back the result to your phone in real time. Spectrometers are used today in labs around the world but they're too large and expensive for everyday use. To fulfill our vision, we need to make a tiny spectrometer that can be mass-produced at low cost. We recruited an amazing R&D team that redesigned the sensor from the ground up using low-cost optics and advanced signal processing algorithms. It took us three years and the effort of many talented engineers to create our sensor. We now have a working product and several applications with many more to come. When you back this project and order your own style, you get apps for scanning food, medicine, and plants. With these apps, you can begin exploring the world around you. With any app, the more you scan, the more Sayo learns about the things you really want to know. Sayo is our latest design, and we're ready to take it to mass production. What I find exciting about Sayo is that it empowers us all to explore new frontiers right under our noses. You don't have to be a scientist, you just have to follow your curiosity. And every time you scan, you're helping to build the world's first database of matter. That has tremendous implications for research, for medicine, for education, for our food system and for our environment. You can also get our development kit and build applications of your own. Back our project, join our community and start to sign up. So I backed them on Kickstarter. They promised a mass spectrometer for around $150 US, and I knew how much they were in the lab, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I thought, I'd be willing to back them with $150, that hopefully they'll deliver a product sometime in the future. I got mine in the mail four months ago. There were 12,950 of us that backed SIO with $2.7 million US worth of funding. How much equity do they have to give up for this project, by the way? Who owns their company now? They do. They had to give 4% to the crowdfunding platform and a bit of money to Amazon Payments, but they got to keep the rest. And at Davos, the World Economic Forum, uh, chose the startups that they think will have the biggest impact on public health, and they won. Who would like one? Yeah. <laughs> and then what we need is a startup like Hackathon next year where we get a bunch of startups and we say, we got this scanner and what we need to know is, can we scan the food that goes in the mouth and then we know what the output is? And what are they gonna say? 
cool, let's do that. And in a weekend, you could have an app made on that platform. Uh, did you know you could do this? In a weekend, they're called hackathons. And they're happening with every industry group that I'm talking to. Um, you've seen the ultrasound, ultrasound that plugs into your smartphone. No? Don't have one of these yet? Don't worry, you don't have to buy them. They're a few thousand dollars, so you rent them as you need them. Do you need them every month? Yeah, okay, well, you rent them, $200 a month for ultrasound that plugs into your Android phone. Who wants one of these? Yeah, and when you don't need it anymore, you know what you do? Just send it back. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's not capital expenditure, it's operating, right? OpX, not CapEx. Everything's going like uh, Uber. The Uber, I present to you, the Uber of ultrasounds. Um, and my clients like GE and Philips are really worried because uh, inventors in China have figured out that they could do this for $200 and so they put, they're putting it on Alibaba so you can buy it for $200 instead of $200 a month from Philips. You can just buy it. All. You know, do, you, do you know who Alibaba is? World's largest retailer. Ser search for um, ultrasound. This one wirelessly connects to your smartphone. Currently can scan bladders. Um, I'd have a go for 250 bucks. Would you have a go for 250 bucks? Let's have a go. Let's, who, who's going to have a go in the group? And when you're done, you're going to have a go? We, and then is there a discussion board? You can go, this is what I found it can do. It can do more than bladders. It can do embryonic sacs, maybe. You're going to have a go? What's your name? Owen? Owen's volunteered. Woo! Round of applause. Just go on to Alibaba, put in uh, ultrasound, buy one, and tell, us, tell everybody else whether it works or not. C could you do that? Awesome. Do you have a platform you can do that on? Is there a discussion board somewhere? Email list? No? My magazine. Yeah. You're, oh, the magazine! We got a platform. It's called a magazine. And it's online too, right? Yeah. And so, uh, Topics Nor Norsven is uh, uh, this is the way that they want to do. They want to be able to scan what goes in the animal and look at the genetics and then build a 3D model of the ideal pig, the pig of the future combining genetics and so on. And so you need a low cost like mini CT scanner so you can, because what you're scanning for is bone structure and, and muscle mass and so on. So you can optimize your product. By the way, they're using, they're, they're um, collaborating with the University of Auckland. Do you see the, the list of all the Australian universities that they're collaborating with there? No, you can't see it because they're not. Because nobody's asked them to. So what are we gonna do, fly over to Auckland and say, will you play with us too? Give me a break. Will somebody give them a call? Because mini CT scanners are coming to town, just like mini ultrasounds that you can plug, and you'll be able, they got them for pets, and they're gonna cost less than $25,000, and then the next year, they're gonna be less than $12,000, and the year after that, they're gonna be less than $6,000, and soon you'll be able to rent them for $200 a month. Everything is getting smaller, faster, and cheaper. And to be part of this, you need to have an internet connection. You need to have devices and be able to share data with your colleagues so we can all be successful together. And if you're worried about, I don't want people to see what I'm doing, you're never gonna get the benefit. Does that make sense? Okay, time to discuss with your partner. If we had access to this kind of technology, would we be willing to share? What would we share? How do we do this? You have 45 seconds to discuss. <laughs> Somebody asked me, why is it so small? It's, it's a veterinary application, right? It's not, not for humans, although you, uh, there are uh, some hospitals that are using this for doing an instant CD, uh, CT scan of newborns. Incredible tool. Uh, next is 3D printing and robotics. Do you think this has got anything to do with your industry? <laughs> yes, but not the way you think. Clearly, within the next few years, you will have a small industrial 3D printer on site. 
And if something breaks, you're going to go to a, a worldwide database, you're gonna find the part, you're gonna print it out in a wood or ceramic or metal or plastic and replace the part without calling the service rep to come out. Clearly, right? Clearly. But that will just be a little application and that's simple. What if we scaled up 3D printers? Like the guy from Airbus, I'm, I went, I was doing some work for Sydney Airport and the futurist in house at Airbus is talking, they're redesigning Sydney Airport right now, I don't know if you've heard. And the futurist from Airbus says to Qantas, um, you're gonna wanna make your hangar slightly bigger so we can build the giant 3D printer that's gonna print your next generation of aircraft. <laughs> and you know, the people in the audience, the airline industry, kind of chuckled and thought, that's funny. And his reply to the chuckle was, um, you know, we're, we're, we are printing replacement parts for everything on your current Airbus 380, except the fiber optic cables. We haven't figured that out yet. And in a few years' time, we'll figure that out. Because, I mean, you're flying around now in jets whose uh, jet, the blades on the jets are being printed at Sydney Airport. Did you know that? Just saying, are you flying home? Because <laughs> you must trust it. But imagine if we scaled it up and the big 3D printer could come to your place and you went to a database of a building that you wanted to print, uh, uh, put up and it put up a building in a day. Yeah, pick you. Yeah, somebody needs to put their hand up. And we need some university like Newcastle University They've got these giant 3D printers. They're very good with robots. They did all the robots for BHP at their mine of the future where they don't have any drivers anymore driving their... Do you know about this? None of the trucks are driven by humans anymore because they were being harmed. So they've got entire mines now with nobody on site. They're, they've got a site in Saskatchewan, Canada, and the drivers are in Perth. D yeah! University of Newcastle developed this you need to connect with universities who are already doing this as a prototype project at one of your farms to prove whether it works and then share it with the entire community and go, you could do this too. So, tell me what you think this is going on here. A few weeks ago, Two robots started building a bridge made out of steel across a canal in Amsterdam. Ooh, did we lose a connection? 3D printed bridge construction begins in Amsterdam. And when I said it prints metal, clearly it, re it replaces, it can print titanium parts for the GE engines on the Qantas 380. Um, and this, what it, this is what it looks like. First, they were little worm-like blobs. It was hard to see, but we saw a universe of possibilities. Of course, many things went wrong. A welding machine exploded, nozzles got stuck, and the robot got disoriented. But then, they became long lines, complex curves, and double-curved oval tubes. It was like drawing in mid-air. And after endless testing, we were able to speed up the process and produce this complex sculpture of lines. And now, we are ready for the ultimate poster project, to test all facets of this highly promising printing technology. A large-scale object that is functional and meaningful. We are going to print the steel bridge in Amsterdam. They said, we're gonna print a steel bridge in Amsterdam. They put it on YouTube and companies from around the world turned up 
to offer support. Because they put a flag in the ground, this is what we want to do, and companies from around the world turned up free of charge to help them realize their dream. Then there's the guy, Chinese guy, who figured out, why don't I just scale up the 3D printer and then I could produce shed, uh, sheds. So he got a bunch of industrial construction waste product, put it into a mixer, put it into a printer, and, built, and printed out 10 sheds in a day. The next year, he went to the home show, home building and construction show in China and printed multi-story big uh, homes. Look at this. This is a years later. This may look like an average home, but get a little closer and you'll see the multiple layers that created this 3D printed villa. It's part of a display in eastern China showing the latest feat in innovative construction and includes this five-story apartment building thought to be the tallest 3D printed building in the world. We transfer the design of the house we want to the printing machine and then the ink is sprayed layer by layer. For this 1100 square meter building, for instance, which has three floors, it took us one day per floor. Record speed that's made possible by a giant 3D printing machine, measuring 105 feet long and 21 feet tall. Instead of ink, the printer squirts out a paste made from recycled waste materials. With larger homes like this villa costing about $161,000 to produce, many are saying it could be a game changer for the construction industry. How long does it take to print a floor? A day. And then it takes 24 hours for it to cure. And then the robot lifts itself up <laughs> on the cured floor and prints another one and waits a day. This is not science fiction any longer. This is science reality. The whole world, the entire manufacturing community will be shifting to what we call additive manufacturing. 50, it'll, 50, in, in 10 years time, 50% of all of manufacturing will be additive manufacturing like this. And you know us futurists, we're very conservative with our estimates. Then there's a the robot Bricky in Perth, just to make the house for you. saying the human's coming along and cleaning up after the robot. <laughs> Just saying. There are universities in Australia where students are building these things right now. University of Newcastle is just one, but they're all over the country. Have you guys connected with them and asked them to participate in a trial at your place. If you haven't, get connected to them. They all have charters to engage with industry. And they don't know anybody in industry. Does anybody here know anybody in industry? <laughs> Just say it. Turn to the person next to you and ask them, what are you going to print out on your giant 3D printer? You have 45 seconds. Your time begins now. Synthetic biology and digital medicine, and I have to say, I'm clearly biased in this area because my 19-year-old daughter has chosen this as her field of study. She's doing a degree at UNSW right now. It's a five-year degree where it's a two-part degree. You get a bachelor's and a master's in bioinformatics, biomedical information, uh, biomedical engineering, and it is right in this area, synthetic biology and medicine but it's directly related to your industry because you have a product that right now produces one product. Read the book. You don't get wool from your pigs, do you? Not yet. <laughs> Just saying. With um, genetics, anything is possible. And my daughter's really ex uh, excited to get her desktop printer that she's getting soon. She's on this biomod team that's going, a Harvard uh, contest, going to a Google's headquarters in October. She's really excited. Her little 3D printer will print 
new life forms with new DNA that she will edit with a program on her computer. You think I'm making this up, don't you? This will change your industry forever and it's just over the horizon, literally over the horizon. But the goat, the goat industry is ahead of you. You may have heard. They've worked with industry and the defense industry specifically, public safety and defense, to produce goats that produce silk. Have you seen this? Yeah, go to Horizon if you want to see uh, more. Some people say this is playing uh, God. Some people know that we have been genetically modifying our food since the dawn of human history. It was called the first technology that we used to mo genetically modify our food. You'll read about in abundance. What technology was that? Helped us survive the last ice age. Fire. <laughs> what comes next? Genetically modified pig farms could grow 100,000 organs per year for human transplant. I don't know if you heard, we've had a huge shortage for kidney, lungs, and heart. And pigs are ideal for producing this. Um, a pig's heart, I'm told, is very similar in structure to a human heart. Now, you might think this is crazy, but the esteemed medical journey, journal, Nature, had a cover article on this a few years ago. And one of the richest self-made women in America, at number 35, Martine Rothblatt, worth almost $400 million, has made it her personal mission in life to uh, produce pigs at her facility that will uh, produce human replacement organs. But not just that whole organs, medical devices, cell therapy, human therapies, developing gene therapy, nuclear transfer. It's a whole ecosystem and it's coming soon because there's about oh, 30,000 scientists at universities working on this around the globe right now. It's just around the horizon. And soon you will have two products from your pigs. One will be meat and the other could be medicine. I know this is really sort of mind-shifting ideas, but people are already working on that. You can see what they're doing with the goats. Last conversation to have. Are we gonna be part of this industry and be the disruptors, or are we gonna be the disrupted? You've got one minute to discuss. Your time begins now. People have already been asking me, where is a copy of my slides? I don't know if you're on LinkedIn, but if you're on LinkedIn, just look, search on my name. I've already uploaded my slides. Obviously, I can't l upload gigabytes worth of uh, video, but if you, put, if you put in goats and spider milk, you'll find the Horizon uh, program. This certainly isn't the end of the, the conversation, although I will have to rush off to get a four o'clock flight, I'm afraid. But this is just the start of the conversation. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that I'd love to share with you, and this is gonna be a big surprise to you, but you're gonna get an email from my office, and it's gonna give you a phone number or a website you can dial into. For the next 12 months, you can ask me anything. And you know what you should be asking me? Uh, who's gonna help us with our benchmarking? You know, where we share our data. Who's gonna uh, do the scanner? Who's gonna print the 3D shed? Let's have a conversation about that so I can connect you to resources that are already out there that would love to work with you, the startup community and the research community that are looking for industry partners right now. The government has said them that to them they have to do this. <laughs> they have to do this. This is not the end of the conversation. 12 months of Call Craig and ask him anything. It's on a Monday afternoon, fourth Monday of every month at 12 p.m. Ask me anything for the next 12 months. i really love to help you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to work with you. Thanks very much.